Hey guys, welcome to Rockstar Superhero Podcast number one. And I couldn't think of a better way to start than an interview with none other than Jorgen Munkeby. Jorgen is the leader, the singer, the songwriter, and multi-instrumentalist from this incredible Norwegian band called Shining. Jorgen shared lots of insight into his process, as well as his hopes for the future of his band and music in general. My only complaint is the interview was done via Skype, so it's a tad noisy, and when I say a tad noisy, yeah, it's a lot noisy. My apologies, but it shouldn't distract from an otherwise fun time. I think you'll dig it, so stick around till the end, because there's lots of killer stuff to hear. I came to hear about Jorgen Monkeby and his band Shining from Dave Young, the guitarist for the Devin Townsend Project. David made a mention on Twitter that, and I'm quoting, I've seen Shining live twice now, and they've blown my tits off both times. Well, who can argue that sort of endorsement? So I ran off to YouTube and searched for this band called Shining from Norway. I ended up finding a video for a song called Fisheye and loaded it up. Fortunately for me, I had my headphones on. So when that devastating drum intro thundered into my brain, you could say I was hooked. And then I heard this crazy arpeggiated keyboard part that coupled up with this chunky killer guitar riff. And then there's this crazy odd time signature flourish that ends the intro and leads into this wild groove of a verse. Then you hear Jorgen's voice and he's practically breathing the vocals at you. Yeah, you could say I was hooked. Later that night, I went back to find out more. I searched and searched the web for everything I could find. Courtesy of YouTube, I discovered great live performances and tons of amazing album tracks. In 2014, I was fortunate to see them in Seattle as they toured in support for the Dillinger Escape Plan. The night they played in Seattle, Jorgen was sick with the flu, yet put on a mind-blowing performance. Whether there are 300 or 30,000 people, Shining kicks major ass, and they give it to you every single night. I'm telling you, man, I've seen a lot of shows in my life. I was fortunate to see David Bowie in 1983. I saw Yes in 1984. I saw Pink Floyd's The Wall, performed by Roger Waters when he toured the stage show in 2010. And yet, I have to say, my favorite all-time live performance was Norway's Shining with a singer named Jorgen Munkeby in a little club in Seattle, Washington. Every musician I know digs their sound. My friends love their music. My kids love their music. My wife loves their music and admits to having a secret crush on Jorgen, which probably isn't so secret anymore, and who she says might be the most handsome and unfairly talented man in the world. And all of this is being said literally right in front of my face. So here we are today, and I'm thrilled, absolutely thrilled, I get to have a gushing conversation with him. And who says Twitter isn't good for anything? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jorgen Munkeby to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. And thanks for, inter- and for the introduction. Well, sure. It's real. I mean, yeah, it's written. I mean, I probably spoke it terribly, but uh, it's real. That's exactly how I feel. I was absolutely freaked out the first time I heard it. In fact, I heard it so many, listened to it so many times, it became an earworm for me. I don't know if you know that term, but uh, yeah, 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 the, yeah, the yeah. song never goes away. Um, yeah, yeah. So let's let's just do with the basics and then we'll get to the really cool stuff. But I'm curious, yeah. you know, you, you grew up in Oslo, correct? Yeah. Uh, well, I grew up in a city like an hour south of Oslo, a city called Tønsberg, which is a uh, which is supposed to be Norway's oldest city, where there is there's a lot of Viking um, castles and shit there. Nice. Um, and then I moved to Oslo, which is the capital of Norway uh, and Norway's biggest city, when I was 18 years old. When I when I was done with the uh, you know, with the with the 
with the school that most people take, you know, the, I don't know what the equivalent in, in the U.S. Are, is, but uh, when I was done with that, I moved to Oslo to start studying jazz saxophone at the Norwegian State Academy of Music. Oh. And I've been in Oslo, I've lived in Oslo since since then. So you could say, you know, I've been, um, this is where I'm, where I've grown up. Right, right. So you really do consider it home now, certainly. I mean, as an adult, you've been there your entire adult life. Yeah, yeah. So what was college like for you? I mean, you you went there singularly so college focused. Is, college is how how old are you when you're on, in college? Uh, eighteen. It's a it's a like an academy, a secondary school. So when you went to study saxophone in America, we, we would call that college. After eighteen. Okay. Okay. Uh, is, is, uh, yeah, college is after eighteen, right? Uh, typically, yeah. I mean, you, yeah. Can, you can go younger. It just it's it's just after primary school, and I don't know what they call it in Norway. If you have a yeah, like uh, it, it, you know, in Norway, when you're eighteen, you're kind of uh, it's um, we, then you've been uh, in school. When I grew up, you 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 had been in school for six plus six years 12 years now you're in now they start one one year earlier oh they've been in school 13 years but uh so it's the it's kind of university level here but anyway um it was the first time i had um what i went to school where like like a music school because before that i had i'd gone to um like universal schools where you where you learn math and physics and and uh, languages and all of that stuff. So and you're I, I could have been able to you know choose a music school the last three of those compulsory years, um, but uh, for some reason I didn't, uh, and I'm kind of happy happy about that because I I love math and I love physics and stuff like that. Oh. But uh, when I was 18, I started studying jazz saxophone at Norwegian State Academy of Music. That was kind of my first, you know, real music study uh, in a school. And I love that. And as I stayed, it's supposed to be four years and you get a bachelor. Right. Uh, but I was there like six or seven years uh, just because I... I, partly because I, I, there was stuff I didn't, there was some subjects I didn't particularly think, uh, I did that I didn't really wanted to spend time on because when I started the school, they didn't have a, they didn't have a designated jazz education, uh, for performing artists, right. uh, performing musicians. They had a combination of, uh, jazz performance and uh, pedagogical studies uh, and that 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 kind of uh, that, that, that part of the school was divided into two blocks so you had the pedagogical uh, teachers and and the students who were usually not the best players okay. and they, they thought the pedagogical Part was the most uh, most important part of the study, and then you have the other block on the school, which had all the jazz teachers, which uh, that <laughs> felt that playing and the you know the the playing subjects were the most important, and and you had the students who who wanted to play and were good at playing, but didn't really care about the other part. So that was a, a drag uh, in the beginning, and I I solved it in a way by just skipping the subject that I didn't want and sure. instead just being being in my room practicing all the time. So I was practically on the school all the time, uh, either practicing or having, you know, school subjects. Uh, and after a couple of uh, – and that led me to not being able to finish the study in time. Uh, but then they, they made a new – a new kind of a new study on the school that was the, a designated thing for jazz musicians, and also where actually I actually got into a, a thing where I could choose my own subject. So I chose a lot of the jazz stuff, and I also chose some some um, classical contemporary composition courses and stuff like that. Uh, so when I got into that, and I was also able to to convert my um, my 
my activities from outside school, uh, which I had a lot of because I was playing in, in other bands. We were touring and, and making albums Crazy. pretty early on. And so when I, I was able to convert that activity into school points, so I could, so I actually managed to put together a whole, like the total amount of points I needed to finalize the bachelor. So it right. took me some time, but uh, I, I, I'm happy that I spent that time because rushing through, rushing through a musical school just to get a piece of paper doesn't make sense because uh, what you really want is to become a great musician and learn a lot, and that takes some time. And and that paper that I got in the end, I I've never even opened the envelope. I, I'm wow. not sure what it is. Nobody ever asked me for it. So. Yeah. Well, it's not like you're going to get a job at McDonald's or something, right? Where you need to have the proof of something. I mean, right? I mean, you're, you're... no, I, I don't. And and if I were to get a job at McDonald's, <laughs> I don't think they'd care what points I had at the Norwegian State Academy of Music. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know? It sounds to me I mean, though. So you got, so you got points because, of, in a sense, like on the job training, right? They were, they were, they were rewarding you for doing the work off campus. Well. Yeah, they did that because they acknowledged that. Well, the 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 the, the principal and and the, you know the the, the hotshot teachers of the school they wanted me to continue doing the school and finish sure. it. Sure. Uh, and that was a solution. I, it is not a very common thing to do, uh, but it's there in in the rules. It's an opening for doing that. Uh, so it's not a part of. I don't know anyone who's done that. Uh, but it is possible. I, you know, let's say I, there were three parts, and the the bachelor was really supposed to be four years. The first first two years is part one. The second two years is part two. And to be able to start part two, you have to finalize the first two years and and all the subjects and fi- and do all the exams. Ah. And ah. and that part of the that the first part consisted of three. So, three subject groups. One was the musician subject group. Another was uh, the pedagogical studies subject group. And then there was this kind of supporting subjects which was, you know, uh, air training, theory, musical history, stuff like that. And I, I, I love the mus- mus- musician subjects and I love the the supporting subjects, I finalized those two, but the pedagogical thing, I didn't finalize. So I'm, I was missing one third, and uh, and I played in, I played like Shining was active uh, in that period, and I also had played, I also played in another band called the Yaga Assist, which is uh, was which was or is, but I, I'm not part of it. So, but it is a, uh, it was a ten piece. Wow. Um, Kind of like a mini big band that was uh, combining um, jazz music with electronica uh, kind of electronic music, and uh, really kind of cutting edge at that time. And so we made made a lot of albums and toured with that band, and and I started working with Shining. So those those activities i i kind of put them together in a report and and gave it to the school and they looked through it and 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 awarded me the well, the missing points because they felt that that amount of work was was enough to right. give me those well you're clearly focused i mean man i mean all the all the things you've done that first that first band so that was you were 18 when you joined that first group right was it how, well, how do you pronounce it jaga uh, yeah, yeah, J A. I can I can write it for you, so you so you have it. Yeah, uh, or something like that. <laughs> this is what. Can you see the? No, but that's okay. I'll just look at your face. <laughs> can't you see no, the, I, can't I saw you it on your Wikipedia part? page. I just I just didn't know how to pronounce it. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, let me remove this. <laughs> Podcast listeners are like, "What are you guys doing, man?" <laughs> <laughs> so um. Uh, no, I joined that band when I was fourteen. I think. Oh wow! Uh, okay. Yeah, so I I joined that and started. You know, one of their most famous songs is called Airborne, and that's that's a song I wrote when I was fifteen. Okay. Uh, so it was early, 
early uh, joining that band. And then, uh, and then in when I started the Norwegian State Academy of Music in in '98 or '99, I'm not really sure exactly what year, but that probably '99. And um, that's when Shining started. So I was, I had both of these bands, and I also toured with a little uh, um, theater, street theater group that was called Stella Polaris, which was, you know, running around in the streets, blowing flames, juggling uh, all sorts of uh, circus stuff, and we played this kind of gypsy, gypsy, energetic gypsy music, and we toured around the world. From time to time with that group also and like both in Scandinavia and in Europe, Eastern Europe, we went to uh, Israel and Palestine and uh, yeah, so I've, I've been active yeah, for a long time. Extraordinary. I mean, and you're so young. You're, you're 35 now, right? 30. How old am I? Am I? 30, <laughs> 35. Okay. I'm 35. No, that's cool. I, I've... Uh, I, um, when I turned 35, I thought I was already 35. Oh, and okay. So I kind of, uh, but uh, so I, I feel like I felt like I'd uh, gotten a, a bonus here. And then I, I still do feel like that from time to time. I feel like that I'm already 36 now, oh, but I'm 35. Well, you're, you're very young and used to have tons in front of you. And you, I mean, man, you've done so much. I mean, by the time I was 35, I... I think I'd just uh, I'd done maybe five or six CDs, but nothing that had really caught fire, right? And certainly not, uh, nothing that had seen, you know, worldly distribution. It was just localized stuff, and you know, fortunate to play on a few cool projects, but never really went anywhere, you know. Um, so, did you grow up in a musical family? How, I mean, how did music happen for you, right? I mean, you just no, accidentally I, discovered it, you know? I. Um... Well, none of my parents were mu musicians. They, they, uh, my, uh, but my father played. He was like an amateur drummer. So he was, you know, that's the closest thing I can. I, I got to a musical family. So, uh, but we had a piano in the in the house. Uh, was an acoustic guitar lying around, and they played. You know, they played Beatles and Paul Simon uh, vinyls. Uh, from time to time, and uh, and my dad, you know, used to play you know, drums on the on the steering wheel in the car. That's kind of <laughs> what I remember, and I thought that was really cool. So I wanted to play the drums, but I ended up for some unexplicable reason ended up playing the saxophone. I I had never listened to jazz music. Uh, probably no. I'd probably never listened to any music with a saxophone. Uh, but still, I ended up wanting to play, you know, either drums or the saxophone. And in the, we have this tradition in Norway uh, with marching bands. They're not really called marching bands; they're called uh, corps. Uh, but they're um, they're like uh, they're marching bands that are active and also have like you know their own concerts from time to time. But mostly, the, you know, the, the biggest. The biggest role they have in the Norwegian society is they play during our Independence Day, which is okay. the 17th of May. They march around the the street. That was, and they have like nice uniforms and stuff. Right. So, so mil that's where sort I, of military flo focused or military influenced. Yeah, they got you know marching. There's a lot of you know there's snare drums that have parade parade parts, and then you got you play marches. Right. Uh, but also, you know, that's, that's that day. But apart from that, they play, um, other types of range of arrangements. I don't really remember, but all sorts of music, you know, it depends on the, um, on the director of the band. They, you know, uh, so that's a big, I, a lot of, uh, I guess, m at least when I grew up, I think Mo, uh, almost everybody who, who, who ended up playing, uh, a wind instruments or even drums started in in those marching bands. Right. So I'm, I'm not sure how it is now, uh, but you know that's the way that's the way most musicians started. That's interesting. Um, let me ask you this about Shining, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. You guys have really evolved from a you know 
clearly hardcore jazz outfit when you first started to something yeah. very, very different, right? You're really radical, yeah. really unique. And you've clearly created this hybrid called black jazz. I mean, you are black jazz. It's your thing. Nobody yeah. else, nobody else owns it. It's fabulous. And yeah. <laughs> you know, you're, so you're incorporating this progressive jazz and, and metal and industrial sounds. Um, but lately, you know, Shining has found this larger audience, you know, clearly more, much more in Europe than it is in the States, um, yeah. with a more straight ahead approach. So it's, re yeah. it's really working for you. So with Shining, were you looking to create a hybrid from the beginning and do you like where it's gone and come from, you know, like what's good and bad about your evolution as a band? Well, the, the good thing is that, um, I've been able to, uh, I've been able to uh, always work with new types of music, learn new things, learn new instruments, learn new new skills, new new ways of composing, new way, new in, like new ways of recording, new ways of producing, which have which have you know it's really kind of what when I look back, I, it's kind of been like an egoistic. Uh, project for me just continues with um developing my my myself and my mus musical skills right, uh, right. and uh, i mean even i i love i i want to create great music but i think i wouldn't be able to i wouldn't want to create music if i didn't like it myself or if i didn't feel like i was learning new things or growing or you know feeling that I, that I have, uh, some challenges, you know? Right. Uh, so that's, you know, that's really what's been driving the, the, the change all along. But, but when it comes to black jazz, that kind of concept, which, which, uh, came into being with our album called black jazz that was released in 2010, uh, that came from me growing up with metal music when I was a kid. And then when I started playing the saxophone when I was nine years old, I still played, I still listened to only metal music. And then after some years, I started getting into jazz music. And by the time I started the, at the International State Academy of Music, uh, no, the, the Norwegian State Academy of Music, right. I was you know, fully emerged in the jazz world. I was full, like totally into John Coltrane and that stuff. And then that lasted for a couple of years, five years, maybe. So like total, probably 10 years only doing jazz music. And then I felt like I wanted to combine. I've, I've, I missed the metal side, the metal world. And so I, I kind of wanted to go back to that place with the new lead acquired knowledge and skills from the from the jazz world and combine these two things that I love the most in music. So that's really you know that's the explanation of how we have we could end up with that that sort of music. Uh, but when it but the reason the real reason for all the changes are only because I have always wanted to you know challenge myself and learn new things. And like you like you touched upon uh, that we've after black jazz, even though we've you know still used the word to kind of describe our music and we used it in the lyrics and you know in press releases and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. the, the music is so, still slowly developed since black jazz. You know, with the, our album one 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 that came out in two thousand and thirteen, right. and with our new album that came out in two thousand and fifteen called International Black Jazz Society. And the black jazz word is still in that name but it's been developed it's been evolving a bit still and we're working on new music now and it seems like the new album will be a i'm not sure if it's going to be temporary or permanent but it, it's going to be a departure from black jazz again it seems like okay. uh i'm not sure how big it is because i've been i've been surprised sometimes by you know, what other people think uh, when it comes to us making changes. You know, sometimes I make, I, f I release an album and I think that people will, people will think it's too similar to what I just did. I mean, that's what I felt when I released 111. And then, and then when we released it, a lot of people felt it was really different. So I think it, it just, 
It depends on what kind of glasses you're looking through. If you're looking at our changes with just the met metal glasses, you know, if, if right. the only thing you know is if your spectrum of spectrum of music is is uh, from uh, Meshuga to Napalm Death, and that's it, then the change we did from Black Jazz to One 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 might seem huge. But if if your musical world is is everything from ABBA through through Meshuga, through Napalm Death to Mahler, Gustav Mahler, then, then, and, or to, you know, fucking uh, Nicki Minaj, then, uh, then that little change we did is not that big. So, uh, but it's going to be interesting to see what happens with a new album because I feel like even though I love the idea of Black Jazz and I thought it was a, that album was, I'm really proud of it. It, it got a lot of attention and I feel like it, but mostly, I feel like the musical uh, in inventiveness of that album is something that will hopefully last for a long time. You know, it will. Uh, that's the reason why I started with music, not only because I love music, but I wanted to be able to to contribute to musical history in a way. Um, and that that album is as close as I probably will ever get to do that. I think, but. Yeah. But that being said, the the word black jazz and that whole you know that whole sh attempt at creating a genre is also can also be a kind of like a straitjacket, hindering. I feel sometimes that I'm a bit uh, obligated to stick with that with what we've made, even though our band has had a history of making big changes. So basically, um, we're again in the process of, of just making music that we like and at the same time just wondering how it's going to be perceived. <laughs> yeah. No, that's fair. That's fair. You know, it is interesting. I, I didn't think of it like that when you were talking about the straight jacket. You know, you do create this uh, this hybrid and people do expect because, well, people suck, <laughs> right? People people expect things to kind of stick with what they know and what they like. And if they fall in love with a certain something, like, I mean, my first experience with Shining was Fisheye, right? That was my very yeah, first, yeah. very first thing. And so when I went back into your catalog, which, by the way, I absolutely adore the early Thanks. part of your catalog, um, I was shocked and perplexed actually yeah. because I wasn't expecting, you know, a song like Gore-Tex Weather Report. I wasn't no. I wasn't expecting that to assault me the way it did. Um I was expecting a little, I don't know, more predictable or safer rock, if you will. Uh, yeah, yeah. And and well, and not that Black Jazz by any means is a safe record because it it is certainly not, but uh yeah, yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah, no, I mean, so if we the the the, the the weird thing is that if we had if we had adhered to what people expected from us and if we had you know done what what people told us to do uh, and that could be like fans it could be management it could be a record label everything you know if we followed what other people said we we would never have made the album black jazz and then people, you know, a lot, most, a lot of our fans came to us with that album. And then, uh, and then, you know, like I said, some, some are aware that we've been constantly changing stuff, but other people are not. And some people, uh, like, like we said, expect us to stick with that. And that's kind of, yeah, it's, it feels kind of weird, but like, I mean, I'm not, right at the moment. I'm we're just we kind of like started making new music. Where we have like five songs that are starting to get finished, and all I know is that it's going to be different. But exactly how much different is hard to say, and it also depends on the production of it. If we decide to mix it and produce it in a similar way, uh, then it will have a sense of um a sense of you know connection to 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 all the black jazz stuff just by the sound of it right um yeah so it's it's too too early to tell so you um, you you released international black jazz society 
this year, earlier in the year, if I remember correctly, right? Uh, yeah, this is 2016. So we released it 2000, October. No, we released it November 2018. Okay. Okay. So it's less than a year ago. Okay. So, but you are clearly working on material. You're moving forward. You're just, you're just yes. plotting forward. Yeah. Um, you guys are a lot like Rush to me that the first three records of Rush were, I I mean, I don't want to say they're I, without identity because that would be actually an unfair characterization of your music, right? You, uh, you were still finding yourself. Yeah. But, that's, that's very, I think that's a very accurate description of our music finding ourselves uh, yeah I, I don't I don't I, I don't take that the wrong way <laughs> okay okay well you know when rush when rush was told prior to releasing 2112 that they had yeah. to put out a commercial record right and they said screw you guys we're gonna make 2112 and we're gonna create an entire album side that just goes down this progressive wormhole right yeah and it seems to me that even though you weren't on identical paths, you did the same thing with Black Jazz. You said, okay, here's this thing we've done, and yep. it's been what it's been, but now we're going to kind of shove this thing in your ear, and we're going to make you deal with it. And if you like it, cool. We hope you do. But, yep. the, but the funny thing is, is that that um, that ferocity that came out in that record is what won you so many fans, right? It's what's changed yeah. you in Europe, right? It, it's, it's very it's weird because... Uh, like our first, let's if you want to divide our our musical output into groups, then our first two albums was like just acoustic uh, jazz uh, music in the vein of like late John Coltrane, and then and then we the two next albums were um, uh, were like um, studio projects where we incorporated all sort. We went from being very a very dogmatic band that had a lot of strict rules about what we could and or could not do to be, to having everything uh, available. Everything was allowed. So we had, you know, church organs, we had operatic singers, we had uh, electronic drums. We started using, uh, you know, uh, keyboards, uh, electronic bass, uh, electronic guitars, everything. Uh, and just like playing with all, everything we thought was fun. And then, and then came Black Jazz, which which uh, stripped away a lot of the a lot of a lot a lot of stuff, and then tried to focus on focus more on fewer things. Uh, we focused on uh, like hard metal, like sort of like a black metal attitude, uh, but yeah. So that's that's part of it, and then uh, 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 energetic free jazz music and we tried to you know remove some of the classical stuff we removed some of the um the the immense immense amount of different musical instruments that we had on the album before uh and and uh, in my mind i feel like all the albums from black jazz through the last one belongs to that group um and uh, and all of the the, the two First group, we were a pretty established jazz band in Norway, especially with the two first albums. So when we made that change, it was a big change going to the third album. So that was already, you know, already a risk to take. And then that worked really well with the third album. We got international uh, attention, you know, Pitchfork uh, put our third album up as their so-called best new music uh, thing. Right. And, you know, we started getting reviews in New York Times and Pitchfork from that time onward. And then we risked it all again <laughs> with Black Jazz. And that was, I mean, even a bigger risk because Black Jazz is, I guess, our most aggressive album uh, in our whole catalog. And it's, it's really not the kind of album you make if you want to try to get fans you know, or try to get listeners. <laughs> it's, it has this kind of, you know, I'm I'm friends with this uh, previous frontman of Emperor. He's called uh, or his his uh, solo name is Ishan, and uh, he said that said something about his time in Emperor back in the black black metal days in Norway. He said that they were they were not playing hard to get; they were playing hard to want. Ah, that's interesting. <laughs> Hard to want. 
<laughs> you know, it's funny. I, I got to address something because you you made me think of it. Uh, you guys performed in, I don't know how to pronounce it. Is it Oya? Is that yeah. the festival? So yeah. in, in 2013, you guys did the Oya Festival. That's, there's a, you know, there's a great video on YouTube. It's about an hour long of, of that performance. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and it's funny, the very thing you're talking about, I think you did very purposefully in The Madness and the Damage Done. That middle break, yeah. it goes yeah. on and on and on and on. Yeah. And I love it because in the video, you're just standing there playing the guitar and smirking at the audience as though I dare you to like this. I dare yeah. you to stay with us. And I thought that was yeah. brilliant. I, I love it. Yeah, I love thanks. it. Yeah, and that's that song was the first song on the album. Uh, so it, it, I was also, you know, that was the, I think it it's like a minute into the album and then, then that part comes along. And it you, it was supposed to be, it started out as one-fourth of that length. And then, you know, a friend of mine said, let's just double it. And then <laughs> I was thinking, just how oh, fuck it, let's just quadruple it. Um and because I felt like the, the whole Black Jazz album was supposed to be a statement, yeah. and 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 I, I I just imagined people buying this CD because that's in 2010 people were buying CDs, right. and I imagine buying CDs, putting it on, having this great groove, and then the cool chorus, and then you know some verses and stuff, and then bam, it's just like never ending loop of frenetic insect uh, blast beat shit and it never fucking ends right and um, and then it suddenly be out up up and then it's, it's finally ends and releases and that uh, and that's the kind of album that i wanted to make it it was I, I wanted to make an album that wasn't hard to get but it was hard to want <laughs> <laughs> you know it's funny though every song on on that album does that every song has a moment of catharsis yeah. Every, every one of them. And it's interesting cool. because, I mean, if I go back to the older material, something like Gore-Tex Weather Report or maybe yeah. even Armageddon, right, which you performed at the live black jazz, which is just yeah. brilliant 20 minutes long and just yeah. extravagant and gorgeous and gentle and brutal. Uh, but then, you you know, you go to this fisheye or I won't forget, right? And yeah. and that experience is so wild and diverse um, I'm curious when you when you're playing live nowadays. Um, I mean, with the exception of the show I saw you, the only show, excuse me, the only older material you played was uh, 21st Century Schizoid Man, which of course we know is an homage to King Crimson, right? That's uh, a cover. Uh, you know, is there a is there a struggle to play that older, challenging music? You know, the instrumentals now is the audience kind what, of getting what, lost. What, what, what you mean by older? Older than 2013. I guess I'm saying that I noticed when I saw you guys perform, you didn't yeah. play anything previous, my memory at least serves me, previous to Black Jazz. You didn't play anything off of, you know, in the Kingdom of yeah. Kitchua, a Monster or nothing from Grindstone. No, right. we um, we did play some of it on the DVD, live, the live thing called Live Black Jazz. And right. that was uh, an interesting thing to do because we kind of re- um, redressed, uh, reworked older stuff into the black jazz world. You know, playing it the playing it as we did with with black jazz, giving it that kind of sounds, those instruments, those pedals, that that guitar sound, and then mixing it that way. And and uh, so some of the some of the older music works works with the black jazz sound, but. Um, I think uh, we have a tendency to to just keep moving, you know. Uh, and uh, I think what we ne almost always play in our shows are fisheye, yeah. like from Black Jazz. We always play fisheye. Uh, we when we play the madness and the damage done. That's you know something that our fans that have been with us for some time they love that they love 21st century schizoid man right. but apart and uh, and helter skelter yeah. it has also been uh, played a lot yeah I think fisheye and helter skelter are the other two that we all almost always play but lately we've been you know finding that helter skelter is 
Um, either we do that or we do another saxophone driven, you know, jazzy thing. Uh, um, but you're right. The, apart from that, we don't really play much older stuff. We did three shows in Oslo a couple of years ago where we played. Uh, one show was the Black Jazz album from start to finish, every song. And that's the first and only time we've done that. Uh, and then another night was 111, and the third night was n- new music that was going to be International Black Jazz Society, I think. Yeah. And we we intended it to also be four nights, so we were planning on doing uh, the, the jazz albums, the, the first two, uh, but we never really got to do that. But I think, you know, when we get a new album now out, uh, maybe late next year or something, Probably, you know, there's only a certain amount of time we have available on our shows. So I don't think we will ever play super long shows because it's pretty energetic music. So let's say we have one hour and 15 minutes available and there's not that many songs we are able to play. And so if new songs come in, old one has to go out. Right, right. That's always a painful process, too, because you as an artist, you're always evolving, right? So you want to play the latest stuff. You want to show it off. That's why you're writing it. And the audience says, no, no, fish eye, give us fish eye. Yeah, but what's been interesting is that, is that, um, it it depends a bit on, on, uh, it's a bit different in different countries, but we did our last European tour, uh, our previous European tour we uh, did was in October, November last year, which was the kind of like your, release tour the album came out the first day and the same day as the first show of the tour um and and uh we noticed that the audience seemed to they like black chess but they seem to like the, the songs on 111 better and they seem to like the new songs from international black chess society even better even though that had not been out at all before the tour um, so um, and that shows to me that we you know I think our older fans they they have a very strong connection to black jazz but we still have we have a lot of fans that have come to us with 111 and also with a new album and though those don't, they don't have that you know that nostalgic uh that nostalgic connection to Tishai or the madness and the damage done. Right. So that was, you know, I was, I was a bit afraid of us being caught in the, you know, in the trap of having to play a lot of stuff from a certain album. Like most, most bands have that kind of, they, they always have to play the hits, you know, right. and Metallica always have to play, the black album stuff or whatever the b- battery or whatever they play, you know? And, and I guess ACDC, you know, it's, yeah. if they, if they put out a new album, I don't think, you know, people would care. They, they want the back in black no matter what, you know? Yeah. You can't get away from the hits or how it's defined by an audience. That's for sure. But I mean, I'm, I, uh, I've started to, you know, if that if that would be a problem for us, it's funny that, that, that this is something our a manager friend of mine told me when I I discussed the uh, I I had uh, he was helping me with some record deals and and I was saying what if you know what if, because we were looking through the contract and I said what if we sell you know, 100,000 albums or whatever, what was it, more than 20 or whatever it is. Sure. Then this and that could happen. And then they would, if they had an option, they could do that and we'd lose money, this and that. And he said, you know, that is a problem I wish we had, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, and, and that's a really good good way of looking at it because, you know, if if people, if, I, if we have a lot of fans and they demand to hear the Black Jazz album, then that's a problem it's a good problem to have. Right, know? right. Well, I mean, you've clearly, with the music you've you've created so far, I mean, you've, you've left a legacy already. I mean, if you were to die today, I'd be heartbroken because you're a cool guy, <laughs> let alone the fact that you're a killer musician and you've created this thing, right? But you've left, uh-huh. you've left a mark in the world. And whether you kind of shy away from it, not that you're, you are, but whether you shy away from it or even push away from the black jazz yeah. moniker, eventually you made this thing 
that is uh, singular, right, Jorgen? Yeah, I mean, this thing. Yeah, thanks. I, I, I am. I, that's how I look at it. I think, uh, like I said, uh, Black Jazz is the album that, you know, most musicians don't have, um, don't are not lucky enough to, to be able to make, uh, you know, let's say a classic or whatever you call it. And then, you know, some bands are able to make two. But, you know, m most people, it's hard enough to, to do that. I mean, I... I I, in in my world, black jazz is a classic. But you know, most let's let's be honest, most people in the world have never heard about it. But 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 then again, in our catalog, that is the closest thing I have gotten to be able to put a mark on on musical history. And and I'm happy. I'm like super proud of that, and I'm happy with that. And I I feel like if we were to, like you said move away from the blackjack black jazz moniker for uh, a year or 10 years or whatever it is uh then that thing still exists and like uh, my friend uh, the guy from emperor he like he, he he's 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 uh, his attitude toward his emperor stuff is just like that he's his new music is different but he's saying that you know he's constantly ha have fans that comes to him and say uh, that they wish he could make another emperor album or he, they wish he could make that kind of music. But his attitude is always that, okay, if you like that music, then great, because those albums are still around. You can buy them, you can listen to them on, right. on Spotify. That doesn't mean that he's he have to make that kind of music again and again and again. And and um, so that's how I view it. I, I allow myself to do something different if, that's what we end up doing. I, it like I, again, I'm not sure how different it's going to be. And for some people, I think if we ended up doing the exact thing again, again, and again, and again, it wouldn't only uh, it wouldn't only bore me. I think it would bore our fans too. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, this last record, you know, and I'm going to ask you another question about that because I really want to ask about that thing you just said. But this last record clear, clearly has the identity, what I consider the identity of the version of shining today right this the yeah. black jazz era whatever you want to call it you have this thing that sounds a very specific way yeah. um and uh i can't remember the name of the of the tune at the moment um you guys did that um live in studio version of it you released it on youtube um where you yeah it's uh, called uh the last stand yes the last stand yeah. by the way kill i don't even know how you guys are that good <laughs> live it's so it's so amazing i mean i was looking for mistakes in the video to see that you had actually dubbed it right because it was just yeah. so good yeah. but that's a i mean that's clearly the sound of shining today and yeah yeah it, it's not dubbed it's just um clean. it's just well mixed yeah. and well played um yeah both both it's but it's definitely a, an evolution from one 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 and yet it yeah. still has elements of black jazz that's what i was trying to get at yeah. Um, let me ask you a question that may be a little odd for you, and you can answer it however you feel comfortable. Um, yeah. But Dave Grohl said when Food Fighters uh, were becoming famous, the band was still forming, right? And it was happening in the public eye, where obviously there were going to be a lot of changes to the band. And I'm curious, Shining has obviously gone through similar changes. You know, you've you've switched out with different personnel over the years, um, yeah. like any band does. And I'm curious if the changes are more about the change of musical direction and perhaps maybe some people felt like, you know, it wasn't now what they had originally signed up for. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of curious because, well, Torsten had been in the band for from the beginning, right? Uh, uh, and he recently stepped out, apparently. And, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm, uh, I don't want to, you know, again, bring up any ugly subjects because I'm not really interested in that. I'm just curious how the band has evolved and, and how that looks to you from the inside. Well, what, uh, you know, one option you, you were, uh, one option could be that musicians, that since the music changed, since the music changed and the musicians, I felt like that, that this is not what they initially signed up for. So that's why they want to get out. But other, you know, did you think of other options? Why, you know, what other, what other, what other reasons could you think of that? People? 
Me? It makes <laughs> well, I hate, I hate to ask the question. I mean, I mean, sometimes it's just you just don't get along with people. You know, I mean, I think the hardest thing about being in a band and and I don't you know, I didn't want to put you in an uncomfortable situation. But the, the the hardest thing about being in a band is you're married, in a sense, to all these people. And you've got to, in a sense, kind of. You've got to get along. You've got to kind of be into the same things. You've got to feed each other's uh, personalities. You know, you've got to be grooving and jazzing along together, right? It's it's all one package. And when you've got four or five guys trying to kind of be the same person across the board, that's really, yeah. really hard. In fact, it's impossible, which is why thousands and thousands of killer bands don't exist today because people yeah. just get pissed off. They get They've had it, you know. And, yeah. and, you know, I know Tor left and, you know, uh, you know, uh, Torsten, excuse me. And, and, yeah. and so, so, you know, I just, from the outside, I see that happening and, and I know shining from what you've said seems to be pretty much a singular vision. What, what you want it to be and where you want it to go is, is yeah. paramount. And if you yeah. don't mind sharing, you know, what, what's it like on the inside of the band in regards to that? Yeah. I mean, that is, you know, from the I'm the only one, I'm the only one left of the original you know, lineup from the from the start. Um, Torstein was with us for a long, long time, uh, from to from 1999 to, you know, he played on one one one, and he, but at that time when we started touring, we had the new guy who's called Tobias, uh, so he played for like hundred shows, and then. And then Tarstan wanted it to be kind of official that he had quit, but in reality, he he had been out of the band for a year or so. Uh, but uh, so he's been the one the, the one that's been in the band the longest, except me. Um, and there's been a lot of other changes uh, too. And I think you know, the, I mean, I think there's truth in all of these all of these reasons. Uh, um, I've 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 had the I've 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 staked out the course all along, and I've you know decided upon the changes we want to do this. Of course, all of these decisions are made are made somewhat uh, with the people in the in the band at that particular time. Uh, and, and you know, let's say we we got five guys in the band, and I have a feeling that you know me plus three of the other guys want to do a certain thing. And one guy, you know, is heading the other direction. Then I have to, you know, first of all, I have to, I have to think about what what my heart wants to do. And then if I feel like the, most of the band feel the same way, that's that's the direction I, I'm very comfortable heading to. And then if there's one guy that that is personally heading in the other direction in his musical life, then then it's kind of natural that that person wants to wants to step out sure. uh, and sure. you know that's happened quite quite a few times sometimes it's sometimes it's it's awkward hard you know sometimes it, it, it people are not very good at at dealing with these sort of situations and other times it's super easy like the the previous bass player we had uh, is called Torreg uh, Kreken he played with us from 2008. So yeah. he's with us on Black Jazz, Live Black Jazz, one one one, and partly on the new album. Yeah, he, he came, came to Seattle here. He was here in yeah. Seattle. Yeah. So he was, you know, he. I uh, the funny thing that is that I always, I kind of know that people are going to quit before they know it themselves. I, uh -huh. I and I have to feel it uh, happening. Um, and then it takes half a year, and then they understand it themselves. So that was what happening with with Kreken. He uh, he told me that he um, that he uh, that he felt that he thought that we were gonna you know he knew that we were gonna tour a bit with a new album, and and he had another band that he wanted to that had an, an album coming out at the same time, and he liked that a lot. He wanted to prioritize that, and he also had his own little band like a country thing uh so he felt like you know it would be a conflict of it of he wouldn't be able to do everything and and uh, and also musically he was heading another and it was you know he liked playing banjo and country music and uh, at that time 
So he felt like it would be better for everybody if we found another guy. And that's, you know, if he's, that was really easy to deal with, even though it's always hard to find a new guy. And he was such a great bass player and such a great guy. So it's, it's that and it's, it's a lot of work for, for all the guys remaining. It's still much easier when, when there's no drama involved. But other times there's drama involved because people, you know, because people don't have their emotions uh, in check, you know. Right, right. Um, and that happens. Uh, so, so all of those things are true. Uh, what, what is funny is that we've never fired anyone. Uh, it's just I've never fired anyone. Uh, I've let people figure that out themselves. Okay. Um, and uh, and I've I've always wanted to in, invite people to to becoming a part of, of what we're doing, you know, in contributing as much as they would like. And, but it's, it's hard, you know, it's hard when you're trying new things and when you're, you know, break, when you're trying to invent something, then it kind of has to be one guy that is inventing because, it, you know, that's where the idea have, right. are coming from. Right. But, but, the new music now I'm writing with, and that's really nice. I'm writing it with our new bass player, and it's it's the first time I've had a guy in the band that is so good at, at uh, that I've been able to write with. You know, sit in the rain, same room, writing with. I've done that with since you know since one one one. I've done that with our you know mixing engineer and, and co producer Sean Bevan in Los Angeles, but right. he, that's on the other side of the world, so. We've been doing, you know, sending stuff back and forth. I've been sending my demos to him, and we've been talking on Skype, and he's been suggesting changes here and there. And and sometimes I've been in, I've been in LA, and we've met up, and we've you know worked on the lyrics, or you know, you know, worked on the music. But it's having a guy in the band uh, in the same country helps a lot. <laughs> that's so good. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's uh, yeah. you know that's how I. I, that's how I, at least now, that's something I really wished for having, you know, a sense of, you know, a group of friends making mu- music together and, and, and writing the music together. But it's, unfortunately, it hasn't been like that ever, you know, except now. Right. Seems like, you know, at, at least with this one guy. And I'm hoping that that can, you know, that can even, uh, I'm hoping that will last for a long time. But you never know. Yeah, well, I would, I would love to see this lineup in place. I mean, I mean, Tobias is a is a great drummer, very, very solid. Uh, again, when I saw you guys in Seattle, he came out, and I think you guys started with um, "I Won't Forget," and yeah. it was just boom, right there in your face. Yeah. Very, very tight, right? Solid yeah. player. And um, yeah. the new bass player, I'm curious, uh, just real quick here. I had heard through the grapevine that somebody new to the band had basically responded to a call via Twitter or something like that that said, Hey, uh, you know, I, can I, can I audition for your band? Is, is that true? Or is that some weird hearsay thing that I heard through? Well, I, you know, I, I get emails like that all the time, like a lot all the time, but I have a lot of those emails. So I have, a, I have an archive of all sorts of people <laughs> from all around the world nice. that are, you know, that say that, Hey, I, if you ever need a keyboard guy or a bass player or whatever, right. hit me up. Here's my, here's a few YouTube links and, um, here's my phone number. So, um, but I think, I mean, the new bass player is not, that didn't happen like that, but we actually had, uh, in between the new bass player and the previous one, we had an American bass player called Pete Griffin, and he, that guy, I met That's on it. Twitter. Uh, he he um, he tweeted something about my previous band Yago Yosis that I mentioned. Mm-hmm. I think that's where where uh, or or he tweeted something about Shining. I think I tweeted about Shining, but he knew about my other band, something like that. And I I saw that on in the mention tab, and then I responded and uh, and uh, and I looked up on his on his like profile, and he he played with the uh, Dweezil Sapa, and I'd seen a show with him. Uh, and I know some friends that know Dweezil, so uh, it felt like you know, felt like he was in my world in a way. Uh, and he lived in LA, and I was going to LA like right after that. So we met up at the baked potato, and he was I think he was playing there or something like that. And 
And he often is a really great guy. And then we needed a bass player for this European tour that we did. And uh, I asked if he wanted to do it. So he did. So nice. that's kind of like, that's partly true. But he's not the one okay. I'm talking about now. He's He was with us for that tour. And who knows, maybe he'll play with us again. It's uh, But we try to, you know, we try to not... That's change cool. too often. We try to, you know, it's so much better to be a band and just stay with the people you work with. That's, you know, that's that's the optimal way of. Sure, you don't want to. You don't want Jorgen Monk to be in four session guys. I mean, you want a band. Yeah, I want a band. I want a feeling of a band. I want, you know, I want it to sound like a band. And it's, you know, when you're on tour, you're together twenty four hours a day, uh, and one or two of those hours are playing together. The rest is, you know, carrying equipment, eating dinner, talking, hanging around, you know, listening to your friend farting in the bunk above you, <laughs> all, you know, all of that stuff. And then you see, it's important to, you know, have cool guys and that you like. And the, it, it, it's, it's about more than the music. Yeah. Well, can I ask you a few more questions before I let you go? I know it's late there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, cool. Okay, so... Um, you started doing something back in 2013 is what I call performances under duress. And, uh, you did, yeah, yeah. yeah so I, you know where I'm going with this. Um, yeah. you did a really great version of, I won't forget at the demolition site, I think of your old rehearsal studio. Yeah. And then you did a killer, killer one take version of the one inside. I think was that out in the desert in California? Where was that? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's in the Mojave Desert. So it was like 120 Mojave. degrees, something crazy. Yeah, it was fucking crazy. Uh, it <laughs> um, was. Uh, yeah, yeah. It was. Uh, and I actually, you know, we I bought <laughs> we bought uh, some sun sunblock. I never used that, but uh, we felt that we needed to use that. So, I, you can you see my face still? Yes. Yeah. So I, I I just put it on my face, but I <laughs> I I didn't think of you know putting it up on the top of oh. the, I don't know what you call this, but on top of the forehead. Yeah. So I I ended up having like a circle, <laughs> and then it didn't take me didn't take. Uh, many hours until I, you know, this part on top of the floor, which is like sure. boiling red, and the rest was fine. So it was, it was, you know, it's, it was um, pretty intense. I, we didn't, we, we didn't stay out there t- too long. Well, because you we did were, one take. It was killer. You didn't need, you didn't need yeah, a second. But, you know. Yeah, but we still had to, you know, get put up the equipment, ch- check the camera, you know, get the cables running, making like m- making sure that everything works. It, it took some it took probably 4 hours total I think and then uh, and then we uh, drove to LA. Yeah, well, it was really fun. Yeah, it, it it looked awesome. It didn't look painful. Everybody was right in the pocket. Um I, but I'm curious uh, because I'm still looking still to this day I'm looking for edits. Um but that is one take, correct? Yeah. And uh, no, we, uh, that is the one we I, we probably did uh, you know a couple of run throughs to make sure that all the channels were there and but it's it's we didn't do any edits that's yeah. you know that was that's that's the that's part of the idea behind this these kind of things yeah you know? yeah I was I was wondering how you did the vocals I I assumed you had like a lapel mic or something yeah. Yeah. I had one on the on the I had a black mic on the black shirt, okay. so it's not okay. hard to it's not easy to see. But you can hear it when I well, I, I what I did edit was I edited out uh, silence in that mic because it picks up everything. And if you if you listen, if you look at it when I turn towards the drums, right, then you can hear the symbols like oh, really going in, in there. And, yeah, and yeah. to get and to get the the to get the vocal ask, you know, close as you wanted, I, I put it through distortion and stuff. So that's just like get it in your face. But that also makes every, all the all the all the noises work. So I think I kind of I chopped up I, I kind of muted every instead of putting out a on like a mute plugin, I kind of went in and, and kind of muted the vocal track everywhere that I wasn't singing right, to, right. to be able to do that. Yeah. No, that was, it's incredible. I actually like it more than the album version. I apologize. Um, what? 
I, would. Oh, I like it more than the album version. I just think yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's yeah, killer. Yeah. It's a great, great yeah. video and uh, lots of fun to watch. And you guys are clearly just burning up out there. Um, <laughs> but then you, then you decided to do a Trotanga. And yeah. I mean, dude, you did a freaking show at Rotanga. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you are insane. Um, so how did that happen? And, and why, why there? Was it, was it like the ultimate, again, performance under duress? Yeah, I think, it, I think it is. Uh, I can't come up with any, any other places, you know, that would be like on the moon or something like that. Yeah. Uh, so it was, uh, but I mean, um, yeah, for those of you who ha- don't know what it is, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, a mountain um, tongue in a way. It's it's a mountain rock that you know, sticks out uh, in thin air. And it's like seven hundred meters, which is two thousand two thousand two hundred yeah, feet lovely. above ground. Um, and it's in the middle of a mountain in Norway. There's snow everywhere. There's no way of, you know, there's no roads, nothing going there. So the audience would have to to walk up there for five hours uh, to get to the show. And we had to fly up all the equipment by helicopters with, you know, all the backline, uh, the instruments, a PA system, mix, mixing console, cables, a power generator to have power to the to do all the equipment and uh, you know materials to to make it drum riser so the drums wouldn't roll yeah. off and fall into the abyss, you know. Yeah. Um. So that was uh, that was the place, and there was a local guy. And there was a local guy to just came, coming up with the idea. He was he's been organizing festivals in that area of the of the country before and so i we played on one of his festivals before and now we have this idea of putting a band on this this rock out in the <laughs> air um yeah and it's never been done before and uh, and, and no wonder because it's you know super dangerous and we actually had no idea if the if that thing would could stand the the weight of us, or it could if it could stand. Uh, you know, when we started playing with all the low frequency right. rumbling, you know, it would just break up. Right. Or and if it didn't break up, it's still a huge risk just just walking around there because if you fall off, you're dead. And just like I think a month or two, uh, a, a girl fell off and she died immediately. Oh um, so, but he came up with the idea and, uh, we, you know, looked into the economy of it and tried to get, you know, local banks or local, you know, com- uh, companies to be able to sponsor the whole thing and, and managed to, you know, get it together, uh, financially. And the, the idea was also to film it and record it because that, you know, that's what I, that's what I, I wanted. And yeah. he wanted the concert and I wanted the, the footage, uh, so um, so we did the concert and we managed to get you know most of the cameras worked which was great and we managed to uh, to record it all and we we played a show like from start to finish not very long I think we played like thirty minutes and um, and I pieced together you know some video footage from you know the, we had a drone and we had cameraman and we we had a lot of footage that I pieced together for one of the songs and sent them sent the tracks to our, mix, our mixing guy in Los Angeles and there's no edits there either wow. Uh, wow. because we don't have any you know we don't have we played one 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 right one, one run through so there's nothing to no other takes to take from and he mixed it and then that's that's what it is I see you stuck the new guys on the end too. That was hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's pretty funny. Yeah, stuck the new guy on the end. I think yeah, to to tell you the truth, some of us were not comfortable being up there. Oh yeah, uh, the guitar player was really not comfortable. So it was, uh, and the drums had to be where they were, right? Uh, because we we had to be able to. Uh, we had to be able to walk. If, if anyone panicked, they had to be able to kind of quickly go from the tongue to kind of mainland, right. so to speak. Uh, so, and I had to be in the middle uh, just for for the sake of filming. 
and, and yeah, so it was either the guitar player or the bass player, and it's it's fun to put the new guy out there. But he is, <laughs> he was he was happy with it. He's really he's a really uh, steady guy. So he 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 kept cool. Yeah, no, I, it's funny because I was thinking as I was watching it. Okay, so Jorgen knows he might die, so yeah. he's just going for it because I mean you're stomping. I, I watch you. You're constantly stomping on the rock, and that yeah. I was just like, man, this is some uh, road runner and wily e. coyote type stuff, right? Just super dangerous. <laughs> yeah, very yeah. cool. Um, well, let me uh, ask you about the new record really quick before I let you go. Um, yeah. So your latest record, uh, International Black Jazz Society, uh, re- yeah. re- released on Spine Farm, right? Yeah, and it's a it's a it's a killer CD, man. Um, something you should really be proud of. And I'm curious, do you consider it more in line with one one one, or is it a new phase? I mean, you know, with the things we've talked about before. I mean, um, I I don't know. I sense a ton of similarities, but there are things that move in new directions for me. Yeah. As an example, um, House of Control. Yeah. Th- that is the best song by far to me. Thanks. I mean, it's it's an extraordinary Thanks. song, and it, it it's kind of like um, you're taking black jazz and you're melting it with country and western. I mean, it's got this really yeah. unique. I can't even describe it, but it has this really unique sound. It's very mind bending, and it it actually almost sounds like you were influenced a little bit by Casualties of Cool. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can see. I can see uh, what you're saying. It's, I, it's, um, I, I, I didn't really. Um, I wasn't conscious of that, but I, I see what you're saying here. The, the casualties of cool with Devin Townsend has, has some kind of countryish guitar stuff going on, but it's still you know distorted and, uh, and the opening guitar, that that kind of thing. Uh, has this kind of country twang. stomping vibe to it. Yeah, it's got a but twang. But I think, if, I, think uh, I view that album as, if you if you leave out House of Control, the rest of it I feel like is one part black jazz and one part 111. Uh, the black jazz part, you know, is you got some uh, in instrumental parts where there is a lot of energy and there's free replaying and you got you also got some songs where you have the industrial aggression there and then and then you have a couple of songs that are more focused and more kind of industrial rock uh cat more catchy songs that are that kind of stems from the 111 album and uh, so that's how i view it one part the, what i feel is the best parts of black chest and the best parts of 111 and then you got House of Control, which which is something different. Which at that time I felt like it was something I wanted to try out. I wanted to see uh, how it would sound if I sang more, and I wanted to see how it would sound if we started using, you know, chords again. Which is something we did back in the days. But when we started Black Jazz, we stripped away the the chord structures and and made it more modal and more, you know. In a less ordinary chord structures, right? More and I riffy. wanted to see chord progression. You know? oh, right, right, right. Sorry. And, and I, I wanted to see if, uh, how it would sound if we, if we did a little bit of that. Um, and uh, and I felt that if that worked, that that was something we could do more of. And if it didn't work, then at least we tried. And it seems to a lot of people be a song that they like a lot and i like it a lot and we play it live and it works well so that has definitely opened up you know and it's 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 inspired some of the new stuff we're doing we're allowing ourselves to to incorporate chord incorporate chord progressions and some melodic singing uh, in the new stuff uh, i'm not saying all the new stuff sounds like house of control but right. it, it's opened up a bit so that's kind of like how I view the that album. I think that's maybe why I enjoyed it so much, and it's not to say that I don't love the screaming because I like you know virtually everything you're doing. Uh, but but yeah, House of Control definitely has it's it's more uh, you know there's just more melody in it. You know, yeah. less yeah. less riffing, and and the choruses have this sort of epic operatic feel to them. 
They, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. that's very, very different, right? It's a slower song. And yeah. and yeah, the twang in it has a, it's just a certain kind of groove that is very, but, very um, different from the rest of the record. All the stuff you're saying now kind of feels like it could apply to the, a lot of the new stuff we're doing. Well, that's cool. So that, yeah. So, well, I mean, <laughs> we'll see how it turns out, but it's a, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting to hear, to hear you say that because, and then, and then just, I'm thinking that that uh, and just understanding how you know how it's probably that song is has been leading us to what's coming. Right, right. Yeah. Well, it shows I have good taste too. <laughs> what? It shows I have good taste as well. <laughs> <laughs> and so, are audiences uh, you know responding well to it? Uh, what, what's your thinking on you know how people are enjoying the new record or not enjoying it? What's that? What's that like? Yeah, um, like yeah, on when we're touring Europe, the new uh, the stuff from the new album is the stuff that that the audience are enjoying the most nice you could see it clearly and and it it surprised me quite a bit uh, on their la on the last on the previous tour because the album was just been released and usually it takes some time so people you know people have to get used to the the songs first before before they kind of really enjoy it live uh, so uh it took me by surprise i didn't expect it to be the news i didn't expect the new music to be to be received that well uh, and and also house of control i was a bit worried that people you know had to have like 100 percent energy all the time but it seems like that song you know in in a full set of you know just full-on blasting that song is a very nice little breather you know right, right. um yeah it's That's been working great it's a great thing. I, I, I'm really happy to hear your, not to say you're moving in a different direction, but that you just keep evolving and keep growing. And yeah. um, I mean, house control is very, very much evidence of that. So I, it's going to be, it. I'm waiting for, let me check my email here from, uh, uh, yeah, I said, I'm waiting for, uh, I shot a, a music video for that song. I was part of a music video for that song in LA. Cool. Yeah, a couple of uh, months ago, and uh, I haven't seen a version yet, but it seems like I'll be getting the first draft in a couple of days. So that's gonna be so. It's gonna be hopefully gonna be out in a month. I think a what? video for that song. You go back and forth to LA a lot. Is there? Uh, I mean, you have your producer and you have a engineer friend there, right? Yeah, it's uh, kind of like the same guy. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. uh, so why LA? Is that just because that's where he's at, or do you have a specific uh, studio you like to work with? Or it started with him being there. You know, I went there to work with him, um, and then I started enjoying that be, being there, and I started going there more often. Um, so, um, yeah, gonna buy a cool. house there. <laughs> gonna move to I, LA. I, I wish. I, I. I. You know. I. I was. It was a moment that I, where I was about to buy a house, uh, but I ended up not doing it. I'm not kind of you know happy about that because, like you know, owning a bunch of houses is not, um, you know, the more the more stuff you own, the more the thing seems to own you. You yeah. know, like you have to, you know, you have to worry about the value of it. You have to, suddenly you're you're looking at you know the the stock market and the currency rates and all of that shit. And you're wondering if the market will crash or when you're going to buy and when you're going to sell. And then, and then the pipes burst and you're wondering what the plumber cost and yeah. all that. Shit. So, um, um, but I didn't buy a house, but I, you know, I'd love to live in LA, um, for some time, but but like I mentioned earlier in the, in the in the interview, uh, right now Europe seems to be the place where it kind of takes off quicker than in the U.S. So I, at the last the last year I've been focusing on Europe touring wise, and that's also why I've you know why I've um, put the U.S. on hold a bit. And then, but the plan is to you know get Europe going, and then 
focusing on the U.S. again. So maybe, maybe that L.A. house will will come in the end. You know? Yeah. Well, you have you know you have friends there, so I'm sure you have places to stay. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be cool. Well, I'd love to love to run into you if you come into L.A. I'm gonna make yeah. sure I fly down yeah. there. Um, would- yeah. One last question for you. Um, yeah. Do you have any ambitions outside of music or art in general? I mean, do you see yourself doing something different as you get older? Maybe starting a nonprofit to teach kids how to play the sax. You know, what I mean, what what's your what's your end game? Where are you going from here? Um, you know, I there's a lot of stuff I like to do, but uh, I seem to be short on time all the time. Yeah. Um, so that's why I haven't been able to you know do much outside of music but you know i enjoy being involved in the videos i enjoy uh being involved in the artwork and all the visuals and uh and i enjoy you know i've I've been you know studying music and i enjoy theory and i enjoy i enjoy uh, learning new stuff and i also enjoy teaching so at least I enjoy teaching to on a high level, you know. Right. So I've been doing that a little bit, but um, I enjoy playing and making music more. So I, I think, think that's you know that's I'm I'm gonna stay with that for a long time. I think I, I when I was a kid, I I did a lot of martial arts, oh, which is something I really miss. Um, but I haven't, you know, the last. I did jujitsu, and you know, and that turned to kind of mixed martial arts stuff. Um, uh, but the last ten years, I think, or at least seven years, I haven't had time to do that. So it's uh, uh, that's a problem. I don't have enough time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think any of us do. But you know, look, no. you're, you're singularly focused. Um, you're extraordinarily talented, and um, you're a heck of a cool guy. So just, just man, thank you so much. I, I, you know, I. I can't even exaggerate how cool this is for me. It's 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 weird because I'm a fan. Um, obviously, you know, now starting this podcast, this has changed the way things are up for me. But I can't help the yeah. fact that underneath, I'm gushing like a little girl. So so, <laughs> it's very very cool, Jorgen. Thank you so much, man. I really really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, and wish I uh, had a video card for you so you would have somebody to stare at instead of your computer the whole time. But I appreciate uh, you hanging in there with me, man. It's been a great 90 minutes, okay? No problem. All right, buddy. And I'll let, I'll let you know when I'm uh, when I'm uh, like when we're back in the U.S. and uh, if we're back and when we're back, we're probably gonna gonna drop by Seattle. So well, I'll just see you then. I will put hundreds, if not thousands. Of, you watch. I I have massive. <laughs> I have massive influence, man. I'm going to put hundreds of people, but you got to get a different club. The, I don't know who books. You know, I, mean, I don't know how it works on your side when it comes to booking. But you know, for example, I, I'll end with this: Devin Townsend. Every time he comes to town, he plays at this club called Studio Seven. And I'm yeah. sorry, people who are listening to this who like Studio Seven. It's a crap hole club, terrible PA. Yeah. It's a terrible place to play. And I wish he would yeah. play at the Showbox or one of the better clubs because his music requires a great PA. You yeah. guys played um, at the old off ramp, which is uh, which is where Pearl Jam got famous, by the way. Um, and yeah. and what's the name of the club again? It, well, it, it was it, now it's called El Corazon. That's where you yeah, played. That's right. yeah. But it used to be called the off ramp, and that's where Pearl Jam got famous. The the off uh, the what? It used to be called the off ramp. It's uh it's uh okay. an exit from the uh, interstate next to the next to the yeah. club. And yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Pearl Jam basically put that place on the map back in '91. Yeah. So anyway, long story short is is I would love to see you guys in a different room, in a bigger room, because one, I think you know you clearly deserve it, and your music it needs it needs space. It needs yeah, a PA yeah. that works, right? You, you know what I mean. So I'm gonna I'm gonna make things happen for you, man. I I will. Come I, on. <laughs> I will. I, I promise you. I'm gonna I, do my best. I mean, we didn't. Um... You know, when when doing the Dillinger tour, you know, we didn't book that tour. And sometimes it's, um, sometimes, uh, you know, when I see, when when Devin plays in Oslo, you know, or other bands play in Oslo, I usually, I, I usually sort of think the same as you. Now, why the fuck don't they play here or there or this, you know, because that would be a better place. And then, 
Uh, I think, you know, a lot of times the, the booking agents, um, they, they're not that familiar with what clubs work uh, better than other and also where they are, you know, where they are in the relationship to where the, you know, the cool people hang out. Uh, right. So it's, uh, I think that happens a lot that you get booked to not the best places because it's hard for the booking agent to, to be in the know, you know, of every city. Right. Well, I prob you know? I imagine they probably want a full room as well, right? They don't, yeah. they don't want to, they don't want a giant, you know, they don't want a tent and there's 25 people in there. Uh, that, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah. So, well, cool. Well, thank you so much. And yeah, do let me know. And if you guys head towards Asia, um, yeah. you know, I have connections over there. I, I'm sure I can help you put something together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I'll let you know. We um, our last show in Japan was really cool. Um, that's uh, yeah. You know. Th that audience is crazy. You know, they yeah, they, they have they to are. know your material, but man, they are all in. <laughs> Actually, you know, I'm also working with uh, Marty Friedman at the moment for some new music. The the ex guitar player of Megadeth. Megadeth. Yeah, and he lives in Tokyo. Oh He's yeah. He's been living there for I think 20 years or something like that. Oh man. Well, that would be cool. I'd love to see you guys do a show together. That'd be killer. We, we actually did a small UK tour with him. He played, you know, we played. We, that was the first time and ever time, only time we've done stuff like that. But we started out playing a couple of his songs. Uh, no, we played some of our songs. And then he came on stage and we played, we played some of his songs. And then he played... He's, he, he was still on stage and played on one of our songs. Wow. It was like a, a mix-up thing. Oh. It was fun. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can only I can only dream, man. At least you're you know you found yourself in a really interesting place because you've become this. Uh, well, I don't want to use the word icon because that's probably <laughs> un, un, unfair. But you know you you've 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 become this standout guy that does things differently. And right, anytime that happens, you're sticking up a flag into the world, and that flag people see, and and the great musicians out there are noticing. So I wouldn't be surprised if you're guesting on you know hundreds of records. Um, uh, why don't you? In fact, before I let you go, why don't you plug the things you're wanting to plug? You know, tell us about your website, what you're looking to do. You know, if you're out there doing session work, and tell us about the new material, and then we'll let you go. Yeah, I mean. We're um, if you're out there and you're in Europe, we are playing a, a full European tour in September. We're starting on the sixth of the September, and we're playing every day until the thirtieth of September. We're playing with uh, it's a co-headliner tour with Internaut, which is a band from Los Angeles, and then there's a Spanish band called uh, Obsidian Kingdom. That is opening, yeah, so that's going to be a great tour. And then we're working on new music, and it's a bit early to plug because it's probably not going to be out until you know late 2017. Okay. And apart from that, I'm uh, from time to time I'm um, I'm uh, playing sax on other people's music. So if you wanna, if you're in need of like a Black Jazz Sax track. <laughs> uh, I, uh, you yeah. could check out the the website jorgenmunkebeat.com. Uh, I don't want to spell it out for you, but you you can try to put it into Google and see what comes up. And then there's, uh, there's some info about how to get in touch with me, and there's a bunch of <clears throat> videos that I've been, um, you know, stuff that I've been playing on with other artists, such as Marty Friedman, Devin Townsend, E. Shellman, and like a side project from the guys in Periphery called uh, uh, called uh, Haunted Shores, stuff like that. So that's uh, that's my plugs, and uh, and I, I you should definitely uh, definitely check out the video that Rob talked about the Troll Tonga stuff. Yeah. You can find that on YouTube, and then in a month or so, there will be a new video for House Control 2. So there you go. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, I'm definitely going to link everything on my website. Man, keep rocking, keep making it happen for us, because us poor sad saps who uh, aren't out there playing music anymore, we we love to hear somebody who's pushing boundaries, and you're, and you're clearly doing that. So thanks, man. You're a rock star. <laughs> thanks, man.